Hi, everyone. Good morning. I am Marimar Suarez. I'm a systems designer at Adobe, and I'm super grateful to be here. Thank you for making the time to come, and thank you definitely to Preet and the whole team for putting together such an amazing conference. I've been really enjoying it. Um, it is definitely 7 a.m. here, so I'm all uh, pumped up with my coffee. Um, so this is my information. I would love to stay connected. I've been really enjoying the content in the conference, particularly the past two days have felt very relevant and super connected to this talk. So if you have enjoyed those, I hope you enjoy this one and I hope we can all keep the connection going. I've been really enjoying the, the Slack um, happening. And I would like to start with just a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in Mexico City. I studied political science there because I really thought that I could create some change through the government. But I also was always super interested in what moves people, how do people behave, and trying to understand that. But very quickly, I realized it's actually through the arts and creativity that we can make the biggest change. Artists are such a force uh, for change. So I went into arts management, started doing a lot of uh, promoting artists, went deeper into contemporary art theory and really understanding how creativity is a force of change for the world. And that brought me to San Francisco, where I was the cultural attache at the Mexican consulate. And I was just seeing around me all the innovation that was happening and how technology was a place where things could really, um, where we could really make a change and how much creativity uh, was an asset in that sector. So I shifted careers one more time, studied business and design strategy, joined the consultancy, and then ended at Adobe at my current job. And Throughout this whole journey, I have always leveraged intuition as a means to drive my decisions, but also drive the work that I do. And so I studied also intuition medicine. And the reason I want to share all of this is because it took me a minute when I started in design to really embrace my super diverse background. And it was thanks to these conferences that I realized a lot of people in design have super diverse backgrounds. And it's actually what makes us really strong um, assets. And we bring such a diverse set of skills. And I have been super lucky to be able to integrate all of these uh, skills and experiences into what I do today. So I just thought I, I wanted to share that um, in case anyone here is, is, is feeling like I was many years ago that I was like, oh my God, so many career changes. Um, and definitely the common thread throughout, throughout this whole uh, journey is my passion for understanding human behavior and solving complex challenges with creativity and intuition. And I hope that I will be able to share a little bit of that through this talk. So Without further introduction, I'm going to jump straight to my talk and talk about end-to-end um, -end journeys to drive decision making. I wanted to start with this quote, research is only as good as its interpretation by Anne Burdick. And this quote feels really relevant to everything that I will be talking today. It applies, in my opinion, both to quant and qualitative research. And it's the reason I believe the human element throughout this whole process is so important and also leveraging our intuition. So as I said, I will be walking you through how we built a framework to do data-driven customer journeys that we use to understand the end-to-end -end experience, very specifically by a persona type and a, a task or an intent. And through that, we're able to identify what pain points are along the journey, but also what are the root causes across our surfaces. And that ultimately enables us to improve engagement and customer experience. So I will be taking you through a journey of what we built, how, and how it's evolved. Um, but I also want to emphasize, and I hope I'll be able to keep this um, thread throughout the talk, that it is as much art as it is science, and it is probably even more art than science. And that's where um, intuition comes in. And I, I hope I'll be able to walk you through when it's art, when it's science, or, or when it's a little bit of both. 
It is also a lot of facilitation and building relationships and trust, which is why uh, some of the talks the past couple of days felt really, really relevant and how much facilitation is an asset in design. And it, 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 it gives us a seat at the table and it enables us to drive alignment um, and decision making. So I'll be talking about that as well. So the the how this came to be i i do not think that when we were building this model we had these three elements so clearly in mind but definitely reflecting back and and kind of putting together what we designed and implemented i see these three elements as um really core components and so that's how i've decided to split my talk the first part is a framework it's the process, it's the components. I'm gonna walk you through what that means and give you a couple of examples. The second element is the aspect of iteration and specifically iteration between qualitative and quantitative research and how they each inform each other. And the last one is the culture. What team to have in place, how to drive collaboration with that team, and then definitely the importance of alignment throughout this whole process. So. I'll start with the first section, which is the framework. And I want to start with this quote by Bertrand Russell that I really, really like because it encompasses exactly where we were at the beginning of this journey. So the greatest challenge to any thinker is stating the problem in a way that will allow a solution. This is important because, and I am sure everyone in the audience has experienced this, I think uh, designers in particular struggle a lot with negotiating with our stakeholders on how important it is to really spend time making sure we're understanding the problem before we jump to solutioning. But this was definitely where we were when we started this journey. We were solving a lot of issues. We had super am ambitious goals but we weren't seeing the impact that we expected. And through the process I'm gonna walk you through, we realized it's because we're not stating the problem in a way that will allow us to properly design a solution. So this just feels foundational to this talk. So where it all started and what was the challenge? We were a small design team within the customer experience organization. Adobe had been growing 19% year over year. Uh, that was in 2019, it's now 22%. And we, with that, it came an expansive customer base, um, rapidly growing. And of course, with that, customers increased need of support. N not, not increased need of support, but increased customers needed support because we had a larger customer base. Um, and so the VP of the organization, brought in this team together and gave us the challenge of designing and optimizing our experiences to help our customers. The problem, the first problem that we faced is that our teams had been working in silos. We had a lot of really brilliant people owning their own, their, their parts of the game, but we weren't really communicating to each other and learning, um, sharing learnings. And so that was one of the challenges at place. The other thing is that we had a great machine learning model that was helping us categorize the types of reasons customers were reaching out to support, but it was just giving us the what. It wasn't giving us the why. And that's gonna be a core component of my talk and I'll be coming back to this. And I believe that can be very easily explained because it's a machine learning model and it's missing the human analysis and the human aspect to, to explain what's behind that what. I also want to just really quickly walk you through the journey we've been through, because as I go through the talk, I will be giving a lot of examples from when it all started under the customer experience organization. But since then, we have moved to the design organization and we have new stakeholders, new surfaces, new challenges, and we have been able to reapply this model and scale it. And what we have learned is that a core component is flexibility. And you're going to hear me repeat that and hopefully illustrate through the examples how it emerged as one thing and it evolved and it keeps evolving as we continue to apply it. So back in 2019, we started with the challenge that I just shared about. 2020, we moved to the design organization and we started building the foundation to replicate the model with our new um challenges. And nearly the end of this year, we're really starting to see um, and to be able to do testing and optimization. Now, I want to be very clear. This refers just to specific team 
and a specific set of surfaces. This is this doesn't speak for the whole Adobe. There's multiple uh, processes and really amazing growth experiments that have been happening for years. Um, but this is just our team's uh, journey and experience that I will be talking about. So as I said, for the customer experience moment, the starting point and the reason I want to call out these ingredients that we had at the beginning is not because I believe that you absolutely have to have this in place to be able to start, but it is definitely because upon reflecting what enabled us to succeed, I do believe these ingredients are um, core to our success. And so when we have scaled, we've had to be creative about how do we get to the place where we were when we started. And so the first ingredient was executive sponsorship. As I said, one VP fully committed, fully devoted to making this happen, bringing all the teams together and giving us all their tools to really collaborate and partner. And, and basically the charter was like, figure it out and, and, and put it together. Um, as we have scaled, that may not be in place at the very beginning, uh, but we've always known that that's where we need to drive towards. As soon as possible, we need to show value so we get executive sponsorship because we understand that's really important to the success. The second element is, as I said, we had all of these teams that were working in silos but were brought together to do this project. And so we had the luxury of having dedicated research strategy and analytics teams that were devoted to this project that we could just tap into each other at any moment ask for help and data and tons of collaboration. And that was definitely a luxury. As we have scaled, that may not be there in the beginning. So we've been thinking, who do we need to partner? Who can like help us until we show value and then we can get properly resourced? We had access to data and this is really important, but again, it can be flexible. In the customer experience organization, we had access to exactly the conversations that customers were having through our chats or, or with our agents. And that was just a really valuable piece of data. As we have applied it to different contexts, the data sources are different, um, but that's not a limitation. And lastly, that access to data gave us really specific and identified areas of discovery. So we knew exactly where we needed to go to start doing investigation. And we knew that if X amount of people were struggling with X type of issue, if we really focused on solving that issue, then we would be really improving the experience for a large amount of our customers. So the area of discovery was very specific and super targeted, which was an amazing thing to have. I'm going to dive into the process. So the first, very first element is the data observation. It all starts with what we call data signals you get information through data that is telling you that there's probably a problem. Um, as I've been saying, in the customer experience example, that was literally transcripts and the categorization of all the issues that our customers were having, were able to say, okay, it looks like this is a significant problem. Let's dive in and understand what's happening. Um, with that, we jump to building a hypothesis and building a scope. So what we knew from the very beginning and the reason this whole project came together was what I said at the beginning of the talk. We knew the what, but we didn't necessarily knew the why our customers were struggling. So we knew that we needed to do further investigation um, to uncover what was behind the data. And so with the elements that we knew from the data, we were able to come up with a hypothesis make a couple of guesses of why we think this was happening and then have a very specific scope because we knew what type of customer was was presenting this type of issues what products they had what surfaces they were in and so with that we we built a scope that would guide our next step which is the qualitative research but before i go there i want to just pause for a second and talk about this word hypothesis um and just um, highlight the fact that this is a design-led process. And what that brings to the table is that our definition of hypothesis is probably more expansive than the scientific method or what some of our stakeholders would understand. And so I just wanted to bring the definition uh, of a supposition or a proposed explanation that needs further investigation. And for us, that sometimes means an educated guess, an exploration with our recommendation. And it honestly includes taking a leap of faith and just kind of saying, we think it's this way and then doing the investigation to prove us right or wrong or give us more information. So 
all of these starting points led us to have a bunch of questions that we cannot answer. But those questions are gold. And that's what we use to get to build the rest of the process. So we would then dive into qualitative research. And for the customer experience example, what that meant was very specifically cognitive walkthroughs. Wearing our customer's hat with the exact scope that we knew from our data is this type of person with this product on the surface with this task or intent. Let's go and do the process ourselves to see what they are experiencing. And this at the beginning felt like a no brainer, but it's actually a huge um, opportunity to uncover and see. It's very easy to get into building products and, and disconnect from the actual experience that customers are having. And the data signals won't tell you what's that experience. So doing this qualitative process was extremely enriching for us to be able to identify exactly what was happening in the journey. Now, as we have scaled, we've used different methodologies, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So with that, we would be able to have refined hypotheses. We would be able to much more confidently say, what we actually think it's happening is in these moments of the journey, there's these problems. There's probably we're not directing customers to the right place. Uh, we're not giving them the right information. And so with that, we would then go back to our analytics partners and build the whole um, journey analytics model. And this was a huge learning moment that our analytics partner really um helped us build the muscle. She would always remind us to not just ask for a bunch of data just because you think it's a cool thing to have. There's the temptation to do that at the very beginning of the process. When you're just seeing the first couple of signals, there's a temptation to be like, let's look for this and let's let's pull this other data and this other data, and that's going to give you nothing. So our uh, amazing partner would always remind us like, Give me your questions. Don't just ask me to pull specific pieces of data. Give me exactly the questions you're trying to answer, and I'm going to help you answer them with data. And so we build them also, and we realize we had to take all of these previous steps to be able to get to a place where we had really smart questions that we could ask much better um, questions from data. And so we would then uh, build this model with our partner. And that then enabled us to get to quantitative patterns um, and we use that to, we call it uh, uh, datafying the journey. So we then can put exactly the numbers to all of those places that we identify through qualitative. We can now quanti quantify it through quantitative patterns and we can know exactly what's the size of the opportunity. And with that, we then jumped to recommendations, strategy and expected change. And we are able to measure and repeat because we had understanding of the size of the problem at each stage of the journey. So this is the whole model. This is, I, I hope I've been giving you a couple of examples of how this looked like when we built it in customer experience. But as I have been saying, we have scaled it and, and we have applied it to different contexts. And so what we have had to do is really reflect what were the core components? What are the must-haves? And what are the places where we can be flexible? What we have learned is that flexibility is a core component of this whole model. And it really comes down to the questions you're trying to answer, not the tools you will use to answer them. So we have then up-leveled our whole model to these very simple questions that are our guiding um, our, our North Star at each stage of the, of the process. And we have then been able to, to think, OK, it can be totally a flexible toolkit. So for example, in the data observation moment, when we moved to the design organization, we were honestly a little attached to that support data because it is gold. It, it gave us so much rich data that we could so perfectly scope our qualitative research. But as we have faced different challenges, that may not necessarily be the most relevant data. And so we have had to go back to, OK, what we're, what we're needing to answer here is what problem do we see and what do we want to optimize? And there's multiple places we can look for that, not just the original data set that we were familiar with. And to be honest, this initial place is very closely related to your KPIs. So depending on the KPIs that you're uh, trying to influence, that's probably where you should look for the data signals. But for the hypothesis and scope, the same. Um, we 
could look at the data and have the exact surface product and persona. As we have scaled this process, that may not be exactly the case. What matters is that we're able to have a good enough scope that will let us dive into qualitative research. So the question you need to answer here is what persona, with what product, on what surface, and trying to do what task. And you can tap into multiple strategies to do that. Then jumping into qualitative research, as I said, in the customer experience example, we were using very specific cognitive walkthroughs. But as we have scaled the process, there's moments where we're not necessarily trying to understand a full journey, and we're just trying to understand the transition between two surfaces. And so what matters here is what is actually happening, putting the why behind the what that the Dana signal gave you. And you can tap into multiple tools to do that. And then lastly, the journey analytics um, is uh, that the question there is, where in the journey are customers failing? Why are they failing and where did they start? And again, there's multiple tools that can be used here. And lastly, you jump to recommendations. And that is where do we want to focus and what impact can we have? And for that, of course, ideation is the, the really go-to tool. But we also benefit a lot from benchmarking and looking at how other companies uh, solve similar challenges. Super rapid user testing to get quick insights from our customers and then also learnings from previous experiments. So this is my synthesis of the whole model up level to how we have scaled it and how we have been creative and flexible about um, changing our tools. So that's why I wanted to pause and reflect on flexibility. And exactly as I have been sharing, we have been able to just really bend easily without breaking the model because we have been flexible. So the second uh, section of my talk is with iteration. And here the quote I wanted to share is, data is a tool for enhancing intuition by Hilary Mason. And this also perfectly encompasses this next section where I believe intuition is a core part of the process of, of, of playing the game between qual and quan. And so the reason for that is that I have been hopefully communicating throughout the whole talk. The problem with data is that it only tells you very high level aggregated view. It will almost always give you the what is happening. If you are lucky, you may get the who and the where. In my experience, it won't give you the why. And so that's where only humans can tell you what's the experience behind. And that's why qualitative is such an important asset in this process. Now, as I have been saying, there's art and there's science. And I believe that intuition plays a super important part in this whole process where sometimes there's a balance between gut and data. At the beginning of this whole process, you may not have a lot of data and you may not know exactly what questions to ask. So you just have to go with your gut, um, follow your intuition, that ability to understand something immediately without being able to reason it or to put hard data against it, and then follow the process until you can get to really refine questions that will give you the data that you need. So, it's this loop and iterative model between qual and quan. This is the exact same model that I've been sharing, just put in the form of a loop so that I can share how it goes from quan to qual. So it all starts with the data signals. That's your quantitative moment. You then jump to qualitative hypothesis, scope, and research. With that, you can go back to data and that can help you size the opportunity. That's the journey analytics and the quantitative patterns. And then you go back to qual to build the, the recommendations. And then you're able to go back to quant to measure and repeat. And this is constant loop where qual and quant are feeding each other. And what we mean by data signals, as having replicated this process in multiple contexts, we have synthesized four core components that we see present in almost every exercise that we do. And this should actually be relate, you should be able to relate this to the scope uh, moment that I shared, where one piece of data signal that you can have is the persona. Who has the problem? Who are they? The second one is the task. What are they trying to do? The third one is the entry point. Where are they struggling? Where is the exact moment where the signal happened? And the fourth one and really, really important one is the journey. Where else have they been throughout the whole um, process? And I'll just bring a, a quick example here from the customer experience organization where we were starting to build our bots and we were not seeing the impact that we expected. And when we dove into the analysis and implementing this whole process, 
we saw that in some cases we were sending people to places they had already been. So instead of that particular scenario may not require a bot, but rather solving another problem that we uncovered in that surface that they had already tried to self-serve and for some reason they weren't being able to be successful. And so really looking at the whole journey enabled us to, to tailor the solutions much more refined than our first attempt when we only knew a couple pieces of, of, of the puzzle. Um, I just want to close by saying that, that something that became really important was also distinguishing between is it a discoverability problem? So the user cannot get where they need to get. That's where the journey becomes really um, insightful. Or is it a workflow or a content problem? That's where probably the entry point and the task become really insightful. And so that model that was designed by one of our analytics partner was extremely um, helpful for us to think about each type of problem as we were doing the analysis. And I will go to my last portion of the talk, which is culture. And I wanna pause here and let you all digest this beautiful quote by Fernando Flores and Robert C. Solomon, which um, I believe, again, really helps um, frame the, this last section. So competence may be taken for granted, but what cannot be taken for granted are the continuous choices, challenges, breakdowns, frustrations, resolutions, and leaps of faith that constitute authentic trust. And I believe this is probably true for all of us, at least for me at Adobe, I can 100% take for granted competence. I work with extremely, extremely talented people. What I cannot take for granted is the effort that needs to go into building those relationships, building trust, and really effectively collaborating. And that's why culture is one of the three sections of this talk. So how we started, this is the team that, as I said, we have the luxury to have. We had a dedicated researcher, a dedicated systems designer, and then we had a design, data analytics, product, and engineering teams super closely plugged. We were literally collaborating through the whole process. As we have scaled, we may not have these ingredients in place, but we're, we're because we know this model, we're able to look for the right partners. Um, and the core ingredients of the culture and the people section uh, of the talk, the first one is show, don't tell, builds trust. At the beginning of the process, we could spend hours in a meeting debating whether your hypothesis or my hypothesis made more sense until and unless we were able to put together the journey with the actual screens, show the problem, put the data against it. We... We, we wouldn't have effective conversations, but also that process really built trust. We were able to then have very effective conversations with all of our stakeholders. The second one is collaboration builds alignment. And this is this is central to this to this whole process. We the process of doing the transcript analysis and the cognitive walkthroughs, and in this day that we're using different uh, tools. In all scenarios, we have our partners with us being part of the process and part of the analysis. Um, and that just immediately builds the alignment that you need to continue to make progress and, and make efficient decision making. The third one is collective creativity builds change. And this one feels really, really important because as designers, we can feel the temptation to own the design um, and think that we know better. But in this process, we were able to bring into the ideation our um, social media managers or our agents who are really close to the issues that we were trying to solve for. And so tapping into their um, intelligence and their experience just enabled us to have much richer solutions than if we had tried to do it on our own. And the last one is outputs are not outcomes. And I'm going to talk about the difference between these two, but this is a very important piece. Um, of the culture section of my talk, because I believe that for a successful process, you should be driving towards both. Um, and so with that, I just want to close with giving you a quick snapshot of the full model and, and everything I have been talking about. So the first part is the framework. It's a methodology with a set of tools that it's highly flexible and it can scale. The second one are the key components, which are the three sections of my talk, the process, the iteration, and the culture. The third one is the artifact, the, the what you deliver at the end of this whole process is a data-driven journey that enables you to very effectively make decisions. 
and focus on where to solve. And now I want to get to the difference between outputs and outcomes. The outputs are all the solutions that come out of this process. They can be bots, experience optimization, test ideas, just do it, engagement content. There's, there's all sorts of outputs that can come from this process. While the outcomes are the alignment and the cultural transformation that happen through this process by means of doing this iterative model with all our partners um, in, in really close collaboration. And so with that, I want to close with some quick uh, key takeaways. The first one is to keep it simple and wear your customer's shoes. Do not assume you know what's happening and definitely don't jump to solutioning just by, by the signals that data is giving you. Qual can really help you ask much better questions from Quant. And so for us, following this process has really enabled us to get a lot smarter and leverage data in a much better way. The value of collaboration, co-creation, and alignment are, to me, what holds this process together, what enables it to scale, and what really drives um, effective decision making uh, in a way that you won't have to go back. And if you go back, it's because you tested and you were wrong, and that's totally fine. So building that culture, it's also really important. And then the last one, which I, I hope I have been driving through, is that frameworks must be flexible. And that as we have scaled this model and we have uh, faced different challenges or find out that we don't have access to the same ingredients that we had in the, in the customer experience organization, that we have to focus on what we have instead of trying to wait to build all the perfect model and data pieces uh, that you don't have. And so focusing on what you have and just getting started is a much better place to be than trying to build that perfect set of tools or ingredients um, or data assets to get started. Um, and with that, I want to pause and jump to questions. And I would love to hear any thoughts you all have. This is, again, my information. I would love to stay connected. I will also put it in the Slack channel, and I will definitely stay plugged there. Thank you so much for uh, coming to my talk.